Good morning, and thanks for joining us. My name is Christian Davies, and I'm the Gene Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, we're so happy to welcome you all here today, and thanks for hanging in again uh, for the two workshops. Somebody did note that uh, there's only two workshops. I did want to sort of just put a plug in that we are recording all of the workshops and all of the sessions, and within about a week, they'll all be live on the ND Steam website, so you can go back and check out like the Star Wars Foley um, workshop, if you didn't get to see that, or some of the other uh, workshops. Um, uh, and again, for everybody who's been with us for the different keynotes since Wednesday, thanks for hanging in there. Anybody who's just joining, um, you've missed some great stuff, but again, you'll be able to find it uh, on the NV Steam website. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge our sponsors, the 2021 Indie Steam Conference lead sponsor is Tesla, with additional support for the conference provided by the Nevada Gold Mines. The NV Steam Conference is co-presented by the Nevada Museum of Art and our good friends over at the Desert Research Institute's Science Alive program. Uh, for all of our educators joining us this evening, again, as a reminder, we are tracking your participation across the conference. Your total hours will be based on the session that you attend live. Continuing education certificates will be issued by the Desert Research Institute and will be emailed uh, approximately four weeks from the closing of the conference after we sort all of the data. The museum is also uh, pleased to offer free annual memberships to active Nevada K-12 uh, teachers. You can go to nevadaart.org, search for educator membership, and that's probably the easiest and quickest way to get there. Educator memberships are sponsored by the Clark Sullivan uh, Construction Company, Martin Ironworks, Ironworks RHP Mechanical Systems, and Sitzer Drywall. So for this morning's workshop, I'd like to go ahead and introduce artist Cal Spelitich, who lives and works in the Bay Area. Cal received his MFA from the University of Texas, which is in my hometown of Austin, Texas. Um, Cal builds interactive machines and robots. He scours the city for industrial items whose technology can be reapplied and has collaborated with artists around the world. Cal's work involves biomorphic sensors, light sensors, as you're going to see, sound sensors, as you're going to see, uh, that trigger robots providing viewers with real life experiences. He's interested in the gap between what robots can't do and what humans can do and the other way around. He's had exhibitions recently in Namibia, Namibia uh, Berlin, Vienna, New York, India, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. He also works as a curator, is an activist, and has been featured in the New York Times on PBS and has worked in and been in many movies. Cal, how are you doing this morning? I know you're a little bit chilly there in your warehouse <laughs> studio. I'm well, thank you. Good morning and good day, all. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and take us on a journey. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Well, um, I'm going to focus specifically on light and lasers and sensors for this workshop. And what has intrigued me or brought me to this part of my life or work or career was, you know, early out when I first started studying art in the very early 80s, about 40 years ago, um, uh, yeah, I tried painting, sculpture, printmaking, that stuff's all fine, photography, and I actually revisit it more often now than I did at other parts of my life. But what intrigued me was technology. And I was a junior young environmentalist uh, as a child in the 60s and 70s and had first heard about solar panels and had heard about um, regenerative technologies and um, alternative energy and here we are um, almost 50 years later and we're still struggling with this field but i wanted to fold it into my art and i started hearing about art and technology in the early 80s when I even first heard about art, and that is what seemed the most important field to work in. You know, uh, for instance, painting is great, but boy, there, I thought there's a lot of really good painters. And, and the field of art and technology still seemed wide open. And I could tell that technology was always going to change and that uh, it was either going to save us or destroy us. And Oof, we're not doing very good on the save part, I don't think. But um, um, what I am 
trying to do is speak poetically to the human condition and using some technology in poetic ways. And there is a field of light art that was based in Southern California that had a huge impact on me. And there is a whole community and scene of artists and scientists who worked with light. Um, James Terrell probably being the most popular one and um, or, uh, an artist whose work you may have seen. Um, so having said that, I'm going to focus on lasers this workshop. And what is so cool about lasers is they're everywhere now. And um, a laser is essentially a diode, an LED that's in a tube, a metal tube that's filled with gas. Here's a laser, a $3 laser that's quite bright. And, um, and this tube is filled with gas. There's a lens at the end and the diode, the LED is on the other end. These two wires give it five volts. And five volts is very low voltage. It's very safe. And you can get five volts from a battery pack like this, uh, which has three double A batteries in it. It's actually equals four and a half volts, but any DC piece of hardware will take a spectrum of voltage just below and just above what it might need. So, um, um, bum, bum, bum. What, what's up with lasers? Lasers um, uh, can do eye surgery. They can um, cut any material at this point from paper to steel. They remove tattoos. Um, they can weld steel. The entire internet is run on lasers with which are pulses of light run through fiber optics. Um, they use laser lever, levels to in, in construction, for instance. And a laser you use probably almost every day and don't realize it is with a scanner at the check at the checkout in a store. Um, uh, 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 Something that's really mind boggling to me about light is that it travels at over 186,000 miles per second. And when, I, when you start to think about that, it really becomes almost cosmic and unimaginable that light can travel that fast. And according to physics, it's the main constant in the entire universe that speed of light. And um, you know, this is what's warming us and growing our plants and what is uh, um, what's also a dilemma of overheating our planet. So my, uh, my, my hurrah to, to light. I'm gonna jump right in to a very simple early experiment that um, is quite well known in, in um, all the sciences. And this is a, an experiment on refraction and reflection. And it, what we have here is a laser right here, I'm pointing at it, a little green laser. And I'm pointing it at the top of this fish tank at an angle the light's bouncing off the water. The water's acting as a refractor, as a mirror. And then I put a mirror at this end and at this end so we can physically see the light. And that's what's amazing about lasers is the light doesn't scatter in a laser. So an incandescent bulb, you know, here's a, a you could spend a week on this in the classroom, this one experiment. And First, you could uh, wire up a laser or use a laser pointer and uh, turn off the lights. Uh, a mist or dust in the air or a fog machine will really um, give you a great visual. Um, bum, 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 bum. But um, what we can do is see the light in the water. And you can see almost a physical 3D structure in this tank. And if you were to turn on a normal light bulb, 
you don't you can't see that path of light and this is something lasers can do for you yeah this is why they're so cool in a light show at a rock concert or if you go to hear a dj and see a light show and and so you could um you know vibrating the water is really uh, kind of psychedelic and beautiful if you you have all the lights off um, and you can refract and reflect that light ad nauseum. And this is one of the ways that scientists have measured the scale of the cosmos. So for instance, NASA puts a mirror on the moon. There's a mirror sitting on the moon. The moon is round, it's not flat, and the earth isn't flat either. There's, but there's a moon up there, uh, uh, there's a moon up there with a mirror on it. And uh, they knew the exact coordinates of that mirror, where they placed it, and then scientists pointed a laser directly at that mirror to measure the distance of the earth to the moon. They already had a pretty good idea because they had landed a spaceship on it, but uh, they wanted to confirm it and then see if the moon was moving or how much it was moving uh, in comparison to the earth. And that's a very well-known experiment that is riffing on a scientist, sort of proto-early scientist named Fizau, who created early experiments with lanterns and candles and a spinning disc with a hole in it to measure the distances and the speed of light 170 years ago. I'm gonna keep moving here. And so this next little demo I have is a fairly simple um, layout. It's a, it's a, a laser here that's pointed at a light sensor. The light sensor then sends a signal to this octave shifter foot pedal, which is a generic off the shelf um, guitar effect for a rock musician. And then this amplifier in back is a little practice amp that's really actually wickedly loud um, that uh, a guitar player would use, for instance. And so, yeah, I'll just test it. I press the button, which sends six volts. I use a little extra oomph on this one. And that six volts runs to this laser and the light will hit the sensor and create a spectrum of sounds. If I block the beam, and you can show the beam, the light, of course, can go to the sensor over here. Um, so we're seeing the speed of light trigger sound, which is also, um, we're also visualizing the speed of light and the speed of sound as an experiment. You know, light travels at some crazy number, 186,000 plus miles per second and speed uh, uh, the speed of sound is 761 miles per hour. So in that respect, sound is really slow and, and light is insanely fast. And then I'm translating it through some electronics, this sensor and a relay switch, and then my physical action. And, and so this is a great experiment, I think, that is really, uh, when you start to burrow into it and think about it, is touching on three or four different um, uh, principles in science. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just goofing around with the sound here, to be honest. And uh, the original sound wasn't that interesting. And I'm in a, a band, a music noise uh, punk band, and and so I just took my octave shifter. And and played around with the sound. 
until what, what I thought was interesting um, noise, for instance. Um, so um, questions about this, does anyone, uh, before I jump to my next experiment, so one question that's coming in is if you're using our, um, an Arduino to interpret the light sensor information before sending it to the signal uh, to the base pedal. I'm not. And so um, um, one reason is, um, God, I've done so many shows all over the world and you, you show up and the damn Arduino doesn't work or it went blank. Uh, I don't know what, from space debris when we're flying. And so I've really shied away from Arduinos and then came up with a hack. And, and so I, will, I can show that now. And this is my punk rock workaround. How can I make art with no budget and, and um, just do it? And so this is an Arduino light sensor. It costs like $2. And here's a relay switch they cost like three or four dollars. And light goes into the end of this light sensor, sends a little three volt signal to this relay switch, which really just works like a light switch. And so it's just on and off. When light hits this, I can turn on anything. So for instance, that last audio signal was just sending an electrical signal to the octave shifter and then to the amplifier. You don't need the Arduino. The Arduino would go between the light sensor here and the relay switch. And uh, uh, you know, uh, Arduino will never tell you this, right? But virtually all of their sensors work without an Arduino. And it was something I hacked years back, right when Arduino came out. I mean, I had all these sensors and I'm mucking around with Arduino. I was like, what if these just work without it? Sure enough, they do. Um, and, uh, and then I'm running the whole thing on this little battery pack, three AA battery, which gives you five volts. Five volts is the same thing that comes out of a laptop, out of my computer. And um, here's my five volt power supply. And I can, I'll show another example here. And so here's um, a laser that I buy off the shelf and wire myself. It needs five volts. And so I took a USB cable, cut the end of it, found the red and black wires and wired it to the red and black on my laser. And I can run this off of my laptop, this laser. So Cal, there's an, a, a follow-up question there, which is that, is, so is the light sensor not differentiating between different light frequencies? Um, ask that again, please. Is the light sensor not differentiating between different light frequencies? Uh, it actually is, but it's very subtle. And there's an adjustment on the light sensor, just a little potentiometer that you can adjust with the screwdriver. And you can finesse that signal um, depending on the frequency. Um, one way I've really been able to uh, experiment with that is pointing different lights at the light sensor. And I was getting different sounds, literally completely different sounds with an incandescent bulb um, or with two different kinds of lasers, for instance. So one question that I have is I look at all this and I know about my own skill levels and technical levels. And I, and I know that our educators here have a, a wide variety of skill levels or technical abilities. Are you, you know, for these sort of simple experiments and introducing them to students of all ages, do you need to know how to solder? Do you need to have a, a certain level? Can you, can you twist wires together or use like clamps to connect these wires to demonstrate the principles and employ them in a classroom setting? Mm -hmm. um, all of that. You can twist wires together. Uh, I solder because I'm a good at soldering and it's a secure um, uh, connection. You can use what's called alligator clips, which are very common. And I al always prototype with these at the beginning. And alligator clips just have little um, claws on the end. And it's uh, a, 
one wire with clips on either end. And so, and so for instance, if I were to wire with a USB cable, I would just clip this to the end of the positive and then clip this to the positive, the red on the, on the laser. And then likewise with the ground. It's much more secure if you solder. And you know, my suggestion is get a little electronics kit and experiment. And uh, it sort of opens up a whole world um, of, ele of, of electronics and adds this great repertoire to your body of work and to your knowledge and to your skill set. And it's not that hard. There's a million tutorials online. You know, the best places are hacker spaces, which sadly aren't really open right now, but hacker spaces really are the future for hacking and for experimenting with technology. Hmm. I hope I answered that well. Yeah, I think so. Let's, uh, what else, what else do you have there? So you and as you... Go ahead. No, no, I, I see this one and I'll, I'll wait for my question until a, a few more. Trying to balance my camera here. <laughs> so what we have here is a much stronger laser, this great green one that is um, really beautiful and, and insanely strong. And it's shining on a bowl of, of water that um, is full of algae. And so it's even greener than it would appear with the light in it. And in that bowl of algae is um, muck and mud on the bottom and microorganisms I've been breeding for about 10 years in this muck. So I'm sort of combining multiple experiments. And um, we can, I'll get up closer here and so we can see the light kind of refracting and and traveling in a weird way from the laser, which is what um, light does. This is the laser right here. And, and as I move the laser through the light, it's hitting some light sensors in back, kind of single-handedly do all this. So what's happening there is I made this homemade uh, bow kind of heart that the that the um, is creating the sound. I have a contact mic on it. It's run to an amplifier, and this there's a light sensor at at the back here. There's two light sensors actually, and when the laser light hits it, it triggers the this bow to operate. And so it's light waves. It's an example of light waves triggering sound waves. And one thing I've been interested in is energy that travels in waves. And um, how much uh, energy does travel that way? Um, an earthquake travels in waves. Um, um, there's gravitational uh, waves that's triggered by gravity. And of course, there's waves on the ocean. I have another example of, of wave sounds I can show you in a minute. And so this one, this particular project is uh, looking at primordial soup, this goo that um, I'm hoping we can maybe see some of the organisms swimming around. But really, I need uh, a microscope generally to see them. Um, bum, bum, bum. So it's light waves triggering sound waves. Well, the design process is about composition and testing and prototyping and revising and the functions. So um, again, um, and I'm running through a primordial soup. And the reason I'm using the soup in a way is that uh, what I found is with my experiments with my primordial soup aquarium is that the small creatures are attracted to heat and light. And they'll be attracted to both. 
that the light doesn't necessarily have to be produce heat for them to be attracted to. And then uh, bacteria uh, grow around this light. Laser light is super cool in that you can see it, of course, just like in that other the fish tank aquarium I was showing you, you can see the beam traveling in the light, in the water. The one thing I haven't talked about is um, relay switches very much, but um, I have my crude simple drawing that I didn't realize my camera is reversing everything. And, uh, but here's the drawing and it's the power supply in the upper left corner. Um, the, uh, at the bottom is the relay switch. On the far right is the light sensor. And this is my wiring diagram for it. <laughs> um, it's quite simple. If I reverse it, you can maybe see it. Uh, yeah. You can sort of see it um, in the positive. But essentially, it's power and ground from a battery going to the sensor and to the relay switch. And then the sensor sends a signal to the switch to turn it on and off. And so over here, it's turning on and off um, some LEDs, and it's turning on and off my homemade heart. What I've got is a, 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 I, I work with an orchestra and use my sound machines in the orchestra and we do soundtracks primarily to silent films. It's an old orchestra, an old orchestra in the Bay Area called the Clubfoot Orchestra. And then I've also recorded my own albums and made compositions from these sound machines. And then I've folded the sound machines into some of my art pieces as an audio component, often referencing sound waves or sound traveling um, in a way. Cal, I'd like to see about shifting. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit, but I wonder if you could talk about Armand Fizou and the experiments that he conducted in Paris um, before uh, in the 18, late 1800s. Uh, and then maybe share one of the pieces that I know you have in your studio that, that relates to that. As we just think about ways that this sort of exploration of the intersection of science and technology can be applied to uh, thinking about history, thinking about measuring time and space and, and applications that, that can demonstrate to students where these sort of experiments, this sort of art making um, has, a, has a long lineage in the, in the history of, of steam thinking. Mm -hmm. So Fizou um, in 1850 sh uh, had shown uh, lit candles and lanterns in a suburb of Paris. And he stood on Montmartre Hill in the center of Paris and measured the speed of light and distance to that hilltop. And to this day, scientists all over the world reference this very simple, quite crude experiment for measuring time, space, and distance. And his, his uh, experiments have held up all the way to the point of NASA essentially recreating his experiments by sh bouncing a light off of the moon which um, um, uh, very well-known scientist Jocelyn Burnell um, used to discover quasars and really understand the scale of the cosmos. So I completely geek out on science and read up on this stuff and, and um, often think of how I can riff on these experiments and reference them quasi recreate them and, uh, um, and honor science and honor um, truth and how we, you know, kind of cosmic uh, questions. How do we understand 
the universe? How do we understand our place in the universe? And um, sort of kind of deeper thinking um, uh, views of in, instead of like, we're just here on this one little blue dot planet, there's actually uh, incomparable number of planets uh, all over the galaxies. There's so many, we don't even understand how many. And when, when you start to think of uh, life that way, you view, I think, humanity different and you view the planet different. So I, I'm gonna show uh, an experiment here. And this is a laser light. This is a, a much bigger laser with a large lens that gives you a large dot this um, purple dot on my hand. The dot is bouncing off of, oh, freaking out, um, the speaker. And I literally glued a mirror onto a subwoofer speaker. And when sound comes out of that speaker, it shakes the laser. And then I project the laser light onto the wall, onto this blue dot. So we can see subsonic sound. I went out to the ocean and I recorded the surf. And, and uh, so again, trying to think about um, the pulse of the planet and other waves and visualizing wave energy. So I'm using the audio of the surf to uh, visualize the sound. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn off the lights. I'm gonna point this at the dot on the wall and I'm going to trigger the audio, the surf sound. This is the light pointed at the speaker. You can't even barely really even see that mirror moving. It's pretty much imperceptible, but it's amplified when it's pointed at a distance on the wall. So what we're, again, we are seeing um, sound. We're seeing waves of sound, waves of water um, um, translated to really to a light show. Let's call it what it is. And, uh, and how could I make that interesting and fun? In times I've exhibited it, I let people trigger the audio and um, even turn on and off or change the volume, for instance. Everyone usually turns it up to 10, but it can be quite peaceful and uh, meditative. Um, and, you know, the hope is uh, I, I have a political angle to all this, that science is real, that you can't make up your own facts. Um, I'm interested in sort of going back to the beginning of science. Uh, since there's an anti-science movement, I felt, well, we'll just start at the fundamentals. And, and uh, pretty much gravity is real. We're held to the planet. We're not floating around Earth. and um, Everyone understands what a wave of water is, and that's a great metaphor for waves of energy and light and gravity, and even a wave of energy at a, I often use a rock concert when the whole crowd responds to a singer or a musician or a, at a protest. When a wave of energy sweeps through a crowd or a movement, for instance, social justice. Hmm. Questions? Yeah, I was just dropping in. If anybody has any questions and wants to join the conversation, feel free to unmute or drop your questions in the chat and I'll I'll bring them up. Um, I think one of the amazing things that I'm I'm sort of learning here is that, you know, so your path of uh, pursuing art led you into a career that is, you know, intertwined with technology and intertwined with engineering and science. And they they have, you know, become fluid um, in that way. And I, I guess one of the questions that I might have is, um, 
you know, it, it thinking about how important is it for you to, to have a direct transference of, of scientific knowledge in your work uh, as far as, you know, sort of the didactic side of, um, of presenting and exhibiting your work? Is it, is it just about wonder or are you hoping that there is a takeaway here? Um, and for our educators and thinking about that from the perspective of, you know, uh, encouraging experimentation and play versus transference of, of hard, uh, hard information. Sure. So how does this not just be entertainment? And entertainment's fine and great. And I do try and produce work that is visually compelling and entertaining. But, uh, uh, you know, that's what makes it art, I think. Having said that, I each of these pieces, essentially, I think I have a body of research, and then I have what I think of as an assignment that goes with each of these pieces. And it's all the research I've done, all the articles I, I reference, and a, a statement that I write about waves and sound and energy and the hope for change and the hope for, and the reality of science as a fact. Um, and so there's, there is a body of research that goes with each of these. So for instance, I have a YouTube page. I post a video of the piece and then there's a long list or a statement about the scientists I'm referencing and the concepts I'm hoping to get across. I can show one more piece and this is, uh, this is kind of a big breakthrough piece for me. And it's, the, uh, uh, it's about the scientist I mentioned before, Jocelyn Burnell, who's still alive. And it's sort of a, a, a shero of mine. And she uh, um, had her idea sort of uh, usurped from her by one of her bosses and he won the Nobel prize. And, and, it, and her, uh, she discovered quasars and which helped us understand the scale of the cosmos. So I am riffing on a few different experiments, the Fizau experiment as well with this piece. And so I have a spinning mirror with a laser hitting it. And when the, when the light um, bounces off the mirror and hits a light sensor, I get a pulse of a sound. A little couple things to plug in here. So uh, there is my homage to Fizau and Jocelyn Burnell and trying to wrap up um, uh, 170 year old experiments with contemporary um, galactic experiments and, um, and using ideas that they used to create this piece. And I'm also trying to scale this piece up to where I will um, bounce point a laser at uh, off of um, a skyscraper in San Francisco uh, onto Mount Tamalpais in Marin, uh, Marin County across the San Francisco Bay. And we would uh, do a sort of sky classroom where we're measuring the cosmos and talking about some of the issues I've been talking about. So that's just a little tabletop experiment. And then the goal is to scale it up.
And one of the things that strikes me is, uh, you know, I was just reading, um, thinking about, you know, some of the other presenters that we've had from JPL um, this this weekend during the NV Steam conferences, how the the very principles that you're using in measuring distance and using light to uh, to trigger different responses are the the same sort of techniques and principles that are being uh, employed to measure the universe um, and to determine you know the makeup of of different how the light is reflected and and sent comes back to us is exactly what they're using to determine the makeup of a planet whether it might be habitable um thinking about objects like Oumuamua which is the interstellar object that passed through our, our solar system recently and it's nothing but the light that's actually reflected back uh in the in a very similar way that gives them all of the information that they're able to extrapolate and and uh and understand i think one of the one of the big takeaways for our educators here is just um the scalability of these sort of principles and ideas from an artistic practice to exploring our entire universe. Well, you know, I, I'm a big fan of citizen artists. I don't believe you need to study art to make it. And in fact, it's a, a famous saying that we're all born artists and then they beat it out of us. And having said that, I think we're all born scientists and then they beat it out of us. You know, there's gatekeepers to all fields. Um, anyone who's taken organic chemistry knows that is a gate that blocks plenty of scientists from, from entering into the field. And, uh, um, you know, art is too important to leave just to artists. Science is too important to leave to politicians and just scientists. Uh, uh, though I'm a uh, advocate of science. And I think if everyone loosened up and experimented and played in different fields, we'd have very different dialogues and understandings about these fields and about the planet and the well-being and survival of, of uh, this green blue orb that we live on. You know, uh, these are these are you know uh, you can tie in so many different fields: environmentalism and activism, and and uh, um, all of the arts: performance, theater, music, uh, dance, uh, drawings. Uh, you know, it's it's all interconnected and intertwined. And if you open a door, uh, be that to the arts or to the sciences, it changes your entire perspective. And you don't have to be to have some degree to do it. Citizen yeah. scientists, citizen hackers, citizen artists. I, I think that it's a, you know, it's such an important note is that, you know, I, I personally went to art school and they never told me just how much of a mathematician I would have to be to actually execute the things I wanted to execute or how much science I'd have to understand to understand color theory or how things work. Leah Sanders just dropped in the in the chat uh, a book that I just looked up and looks like I'm something I'm definitely going to read. Um, the Scientist in the Crib. And, you know, it's important to think about how we uh, are learning from from birth uh, and interpreting the world through through science uh, as we as we figure out what's around us. We've just got about three minutes left so we can take a short break before the closing um, session. Wanted to see if there was any more questions from the group. Feel free to unmute and ask your question or drop it in the chat. I'm going to drop in all of Cal's links again, and these are also going to be on the NV Steam website. Um, Cal's also very generously offered up his email, so feel free to reach out to Cal with any follow-up questions that you may not want to ask to the group as a, as a whole, although uh, we'd, we'd love to open the conversation a little if anybody's game. You know, uh, uh, I was watching, I don't have children, but I have eight nieces and nephews. And I was watching one of my nephews once in my sister's house, and it's the classic child experiment. They go into the kitchen, they open every cabinet on the, on the floor, and they pull everything out. And then they rearrange it, and they're doing research and finding out what this stuff is that's accessible to them. And then they're moving it around. And years later, I read an article about that exact same 
thing about a child opening a cabinet and pulling everything out. And, and most parents, that's a pain in the butt and they're working in the kitchen and they can't have everything pulled out. But, you know, it's a, a, a great symbol of allowing someone to make a mess so they can learn. When I was a little kid, I went to my parents' basement and took over a closet, literally a closet in the basement and started conducting experiments. It's pretty dangerous. I electrocuted myself. I set myself on fire. I, but I started to, I found a space, a workshop, and then I started conducting experiments. Look at me now. <laughs> Look at you now. I think that's a great point, um, place to, uh, to, to go ahead and wrap up so everybody can take a short break before we all gather back together at 12 for sort of our closing session. Thank you again so much, Cal, for uh, your time today for both workshops. This was uh, just really amazing to oh, get to, to go through and listen to twice. Um, thanks again to everybody for uh, participating in the 2021 NV STEAM conference. Again, we are tracking attendance. We're doing it through our event um, hosting platform. So we'll be sending out those certificates in about four weeks. Um, I know I've gotten a lot of emails from folks, but they are, they'll definitely be coming. And all of these sessions, including ones that you may not have been able to attend, are going to be available in about a week's time on the nvsteam.org uh, website. So that you can go back and check out some of the other sessions um, that, you, that you may want to dig into deeper. Thanks again, Cal. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you here in about 10 minutes. Bye, everyone. Thanks for your time. Appreciate all right, it. Bye. All right. Ciao.